Welcome to the Block and Tackle Show, hosted by Carl Block. Carl is a partner in the law firm of Loeb & Loeb here in Los Angeles, California. He will be tackling some of the biggest issues in business today. Listen, learn, and enjoy as he leaves no stone unturned during his deep conversations with some of today's most amazing business leaders. Welcome to the show. Carl Block is both a corporate lawyer and a corporate restructuring partner in the Los Angeles office of Loeb & Loeb LLP. Nothing in the podcast should be construed as legal advice. To the extent legal issues are discussed, please consult an attorney if you have any questions or need advice relating to the matters discussed. This podcast may constitute attorney advertising in certain jurisdictions. The views expressed in the podcast are not necessarily the views of Loeb and Loeb or Carl Block. Carl and each guest reserves the right to change any opinions that may be expressed on the show and disagree with what others say, even if such disagreement is not expressed during the podcast. Hi, everybody. Today, I'm very pleased to have Henry Kupperman with, on the show. Henry is the Executive Managing Director and General Counsel of Applied Facts Group. He's an accomplished lawyer and investigator with over 25 years of professional experience. He has supervised investigations in a broad range of areas, including corporate investigations, intellectual property matters, investigative diligence, and litigation diligence. He has coordinated with many federal agencies, including the FBI and various attorney's offices, the Secret Service, the Manhattan District Attorney, and the Los Angeles Police Department. He has worked on a broad range of matters, including complex cases in the environmental, antitrust, intellectual property, whistleblower, and regulatory areas. Henry has advised congressional staffs and committees on the enhancement of laws to combat money laundering and terrorist financing. He has worked extensively on investigations of financial crimes, money laundering, and kickbacks. He has investigated many violations of intellectual property law and product diversion. Transactional clients frequently rely on Henry to conduct investigative due diligence on prospective merger and acquisition candidates and joint venture partners for both domestic and international transactions. He has a background as an experienced litigator, which provides him with unique insight into interesting and complex issues that may be of concern to his clients. Very happy to have Henry here today. So Henry, we've talked about so many aspects of investigations. And I think that there's a lot of people who quite frankly, don't really understand the breadth and scope of what people like you do. And I would say that in my experience, there's people who are, are what I would call retail investigators and other people like you who dig a lot deeper. And I appreciate uh, having somebody with such amazing expertise. And I'd like to, if you don't mind, turn to one of our first topic or our first topic, and that would be data breaches and ransomware attacks. So you and I know we read the Wall Street Journal, we read the rest of the press. There's a lot that seems to be going on with data breaches and ransomware attacks. What what do you want to tell us about the things you're seeing? Okay. Well, it, it is pretty rampant. In fact, uh, yesterday they announced that there was a, uh, a hack of uh, Congress. Uh, and, and so it, it, it just keeps pile, piling on. Um, there, there are attacks going on all over the place. Uh, a lot of them are emanating out of uh, Eastern Europe, particularly Russia. And the, the belief is that these are sanctioned by the Russian government and that perhaps it's done in a way where um, when the hackers get money, um, some of it is paid to the, um, the, the, the Russian government. That's so, uh, it, so it's, yeah, yeah. And we're also seeing hacks from China, one of the, the, the most... Uh, uh, publicized hacks by uh, Chinese intelligence was of the U.S. government, of the 
uh, um, uh, OPM hack where they uh, were able to hack uh, personal information on many government employees, including members of the uh, U.S. Intelligence Committee. Um, we also see hacks from North Korea uh, as well. When they get uh, the personal information, what are they likely to do with that? A couple of things. Well, ultimately, the personal information will be used to commit identity theft. And just about everybody I know um, um, has at one time or another been a victim of identity theft of one sort or another. So that's ultimately what happens. What initially happens is the hackers will either use it themselves to commit identity theft or what we see more commonly now is, is they sell that data. It has a, a tremendous value um, and they will sell it particularly on the dark web uh, to other groups that will then take that data and uh, commit identity theft. It's big business, isn't it? It's very big and very lucrative. It's unbelievable. So talk to me about ransomware, the other yeah. big aspect of this. So ransomware is, is the instance where uh, hackers will penetrate a company or a hospital, for instance, uh, their, their network and encrypt everything. And then they, uh, they, they, they will communicate with the company and say, we have, um, we have encrypted your data. And if you want to unencrypt it, you have to uh, pay us. And so that, that, that's a whole nother component, which has been uh, very active as well. We, unfortunately, we saw a lot of it during the pandemic where hackers were attacking hospitals and, and, and encrypting uh, all of their patient data. And so in many cases, the hospitals were required to uh, pay to, to decrypt the data. We saw this also, for instance, with the city of Baltimore. Um, they, they, they were a victim of ransomware and they refused to pay. Um, and it, it cre ultimately created tremendous chaos in the city for a, quite a while. Is, is your only practical choice just to pay or is there anything else that you can do once you've been a victim of ransomware? Well, government, uh, law enforcement generally recommends not to pay if you can avoid it. And actually, one of the, the, the recent developments is, uh, was there was a, a ransomware group called Hive, which was believed to be operating out of Russia, that was committing ransomware attacks. And so the, uh, last July, the FBI's cyber unit was able to penetrate Hive and uh, get the decryption keys. And then they were giving the decryption keys to victims of, uh, of, of the ransomware attacks. So one important point there is if you are a victim of ransomware attacks, uh, you want to immediately contact the FBI because they may well have the decryption key and they will give it to you. That's great. I suppose that once the FBI does that, the encryption key may not last terribly long because the hackers may get smart, but that's great. I assume the FBI has some team that's constantly looking at these things to sort of try to get the key for, you know, other new encryptions. They have multiple teams and, and they're now being very aggressive and very creative in, 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 in getting it. I think they're, everybody recognizes since the hackers are, in places like Russia, where we do not have an extradition treaty, that uh, the the idea of capturing the bad guys is not likely. But the uh, as we saw with the Hive uh, matter, they they're able to thwart them. Uh, so they've got multiple teams. And 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 one other point is, if you're a victim of ransomware attack, whether you pay or not, whether you get the decryption key from the FBI or not. Uh, it's not unusual that the hackers will try to come back at you again. So you really need to make sure 
that you've uh, bolstered your defenses as soon as you can. Henry, we know what happens when you've been the victim of a ransomware attack. How do you help your clients avoid these kinds of attacks? Okay. Well, ransomware, one way to avoid ransomware and data breach attacks is, first of all, to make sure that your uh, IT hardware and software is up to date. Um, if you're using out of date software and hardware, first of all, it's not supported by the manufacturer. So they won't be supplying you patches to provide enhanced protection. Moreover, as, as we saw um, recently with the Southwest Airlines and FAA uh, disruptions, they were not hacks, but in both cases, they were using antiquated systems. So in addition to protecting your company from hacks, you want to make sure you've got up-to-date systems in order to make sure your system is operating properly. The other thing is to make sure you've got strong antivirus protection, endpoint protection using appropriate software. There's a number of software providers that are quite good and, and also include technical support to help you not just implement the system, but uh, if there are monitoring issues, that's um, really important. And then the other important thing is training. A lot of times the hacks occur because uh, an employee has clicked on a link uh, in an email. And so training your employees to not click on suspicious links, if, they, if they're getting an email from, an, from a colleague that they weren't expecting to be trained, hey, just pick up the phone and ask them, did you send me this email? Uh, uh, employees need to have a uh, developed kind of a, a, an instinct that whenever an, an email asks them to click on a link or download an attachment, that they uh, pause and make sure that it's legitimate before they, they click on it. That makes sense. And I suppose educating them also for, from the misspellings or unusual email addresses, like if a business colleague emails you from an address that they've never used before or things like right. that. It, it, having people, I suppose, look at the telltale signs is, is clearly something to do. Now, again, once there's been the hack, um, where do you come in and say, okay, now... I'm going to help you guys ameliorate this. What do you do? Okay. Well, the important thing is as soon as you determine that you have a hack or been a victim of ransomware, you need to bring in the professionals right away. Um, you need to make sure that your system is protected going forward, that you shut down uh, the ability of the hacker to get back into your system or even worse, control your, your network. And you have to do it very carefully. Um, you don't want to go in and start, uh, uh, for instance, deleting the logs, which is a natural reaction that sometimes people will want to do. And the, one of the reasons why is a question we get asked a lot is, we've been hacked, what data was taken? And you need to be able to look at the system, to look at the logs, to determine what data um, was, was taken. In particular, was there any uh, uh, personal identifying information, what we call PII, has, has that been uh, taken? But then you want to have the professionals come in, fig try to figure out how the hack occurred, and also immediately uh, work to shut off any uh, vulnerabilities in 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 the system but that has to be done quickly and uh keep in mind if you're a publicly traded company the sec is now looking at uh, uh a new rule that if you've been a victim of a data breach a, comp a publicly traded company you have to notify the sec within four days so bottom line you have to move quickly and in those circumstances given your contacts 
in government? Do you liaise with the FBI and SEC? Do you help them, you know, try to uh, preserve the evidence, if you will, and take other steps that are going to be helpful to catching these people or deterring? Yeah. One of the most important things is to get the FBI involved quickly. Um, there's a website the FBI has called IC3, where you can file um, as a victim. And it's important to do that right away. But separate from that, when we get involved, we immediately make uh, a telephonic contact with, with our contacts within the FBI. Because again, particularly in cases like the Hive matter, if, if the, the FBI may well have the decryption key of the hackers, of the, if it's a ransomware attack, um, they can be very helpful. And even if it's not a ransomware attack, if it's just a data breach, they may already be investigating that group and, and they may have a lot of insight, a lot of information, provide a lot of assistance and guidance into how to deal with the matter. Um, the FBI has become very user friendly in this area, as well as uh, the Secret Service and, and local law enforcement. And you, you can help a client sort of shepherd them through this process? Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. So let's talk about another hot topic, I guess, regrettably, and that is in the broader context, employee uh, whistleblower claims. And I know that the uh, Department of Justice has uh, been focused on self-reporting and misconduct. What's going on there? A lot, uh, particularly starting in September. So to give a, a quick uh, historical background, um, after the 08 financial crisis, um, uh, U.S. Department of Justice was criticized because while they prosecuted a number of companies and financial institutions for misconduct, no or very few individuals were prosecuted. And of course, companies operate through uh, their employees. So in the last couple of years, in particular, the Department of Justice has really been focusing on uh, getting companies to a self-report, but not just report the misconduct, but identify the individuals who were involved and the activity uh, that they, they did. And this kind of came to a head in September when Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco issued a pronouncement, which essentially said that we expect companies to quickly notify us of misconduct, including identifying the employees that were involved and what misconduct the individual employees committed. And the view of, uh, according to Attorney General uh, Monaco, the view of the Department of Justice is that uh, those companies that come forward quickly will be rewarded. And the way they'll be rewarded is they will, number one, will not be prosecuted criminally. But number two, um, what one, one thing that happens in a number of these cases is that the government will seek to impose a monitor on the company at the expense of the company, which becomes very costly and disruptive to the business. Uh, the government is now saying, if you, again, come, come, quick, come forward quickly, uh, we will not seek imposition of a monitor. So you avoid criminal liability, you avoid uh, uh, the monitorship. Though, those can be really big things for uh, companies. And there have been a series of pronouncements, kind of refinements since September, including recent pronouncements by the U.S. attorneys in Brooklyn and Manhattan about the importance of companies coming forward quickly uh, and, and, and self-reporting. Um, one of the challenges right now is nobody really knows how quickly is, is quickly. So it, that, that's to be determined. But the bottom line is, if some misconduct comes to the attention of company management, um, they have to move rapidly and, and uh, figure out what happened, but also 
um, start to have a game plan. Uh, for, if there, in fact, really was misconduct, they have to have a game plan about notification to the Department of Justice. Okay. And so just as with ransomware, when it comes to things like this, there are many companies that don't have the expertise internally to deal with these situations. So if the general counsel or the CEO calls you and says, I just got wind of this particular situation in the company, Henry, what do we do? What, what's the game plan that you typically use? Sure. So the first thing is we usually sit down with the client. Um, we recommend that they immediately bring in outside counsel uh, that's experienced in this area to work with us. And the, the, it, the lawyers are responsible, of course, for providing the legal advice. We're responsible for doing the investigation. And a very important part of it, right, right up front is gathering all the electronic data. Uh, we're in an age where electronic data is key. And so you want to gather it quickly, which means gathering the laptops, the cell phones, the tablets of employees that may be involved, uh, uh, capturing all the data that the company has on the cloud, including uh, emails. One of the big mistakes we see many companies make is particularly the CEOs start to get inquisitive and they say, oh, we think this employee is involved. I'm going to go look at their laptop. And so the CEO grabs the laptop, looks at it, turns it on and off. Um, you have to realize that a laptop, you have to treat it like you would a physical crime scene. And the second that you turn a laptop or a desktop on and off, you start corrupting evidence. Um, so you don't want your CEO uh, who decides to suddenly play Sherlock Holmes to uh, go and, and start peeking around in the laptop. You want to uh, forensically preserve uh, everything, capture everything up there. Again, you put together a quick game plan to get all that. You also have to figure out who to interview. Um, it can be employees. It might be vendors, outside contractors. You have to come up with that, um, that universe of witnesses quickly. And, and then you also have to start thinking about notification issues, um, not just to the government, but um, you may need to uh, notify your auditors or your outside accountants. Um, you also may have, depending upon the nature of the misconduct, you may have to notify your lenders. Uh, uh, you have to look at uh, your, your loan agreements, your line of credits, there may be uh, certain notice requirements if something is uh, material. So you may have to uh, notify them. And then the other thing, particularly if there is a loss to the company, you have to uh, uh, look at your insurance policies. There may be insurance to cover the loss, but one clause that's contained in every insurance policy is the... Uh, requirement of prompt notification. So if you do the investigation, sit back and wait and pontificate and six months later say, gee, maybe we should notify our, our carrier, uh, they may well come back and say uh, decline coverage because of late notice. The key point is you have to consider all of this very quickly. You have to get the key decision makers, the investigation team, and the, and the legal team all together quickly to figure out how to deal with all of this. That sounds great. And I appreciate that. And I'm sure a lot of our viewers and listeners will find that really informative. Again, as many of them may not have the internal expertise to deal with this. Another topic I'd like to bring up with you is the theft of trade secrets. And what are, how big is this problem? And what kinds of thefts are you seeing? This is a real big problem, particularly with all the employment transition going on, all the downsizing. And one of the, mis uh, the, the concepts that I think people need to understand, particularly dis business decision makers about trade secrets is we're not just talking about something such as the formula for Coca-Cola or um, 
some algorithm that uh, a technology company can use. Those are certainly important trade secrets. But for many companies, the trade secrets can involve issues such as their, their pricing data, their strategic planning, uh, their customer list. And it's not uncommon that employees who either leave on their own or terminated or laid off may, may take some of that data with them, particularly if they're going to a competitor. Uh, I'm sure for your listeners that have competitors, um, they would not want their competitors to know what their pricing is, who their customers are, what their strategic plan is going forward. So these are all um, areas that can create harm for companies and particularly with employees coming and going uh, with all the transition going on. Um, we're seeing a big pickup in, in the misappropriation of this kind of data. That makes sense. And as it is easier to leave and sometimes it's not voluntary, I could see how you'd have such a huge jump in things like this when you're contacted about something that doesn't make sense, like the competitor having some information about what you're doing or being contacting customers that they would otherwise not know that you had, what do you do? Well, the first thing we do is we sit down with the client and, and try to understand the flow of information. In particular, we ask, well, did you have employees that have recently left that might have had this data? And if so, the first thing we want to do is look at their uh, company devices. We see many instances in our trade secrets cases where an employee is either terminated or voluntarily quits, and you go and look at uh, their activity uh, 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 in the week or two before they've left and they're suddenly downloading massive amounts of proprietary data. Uh, you, you want to um, do that, do that again, very, very quickly. And uh, is it usually the case that employees leave, you know, a, a forensic trail and so you can find it? Not, not always. But we've had a lot of a lot of success in 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 the, in the, in this area, but again, uh, the the success is is dependent upon having great systems in place. Uh, one I think uh, uh, challenge that comes up in cases is where companies allow employees to use personal devices such as their cell phone for work. Or, or their own laptop for work. Uh, you start to run into real problems because you don't have control over those devices and you start to get into all kinds of privacy issues and they may not be required to give you uh, access to their devices. So first of all, you wanna make sure all your devices um, that employees are using are company owned. The other thing we recommend, and this also applies in the data breach area and ransomware, is you really want to try to keep all your data on the cloud. Um, and this becomes important for a number of reasons. First of all, if, if data is kept on a laptop, for instance, and that laptop is stolen, someone leaves it in, you know, in their car, uh, or they're working from remotely from home, and they have a break-in and the laptop is stolen. If there's company data or customer data, that can be real problematic. If all that data is kept up in the cloud, the device, the individual device becomes less uh, relevant. And again, the other thing is if employees have left or working from home and you're terminating them, uh, or you suspect they've stolen trade secrets, again, you, you're able to monitor and review what they've done by looking at your cloud-based system as opposed to having to rely on an individual device. Now, I, I think that's, that's good advice. The, uh, the last topic I want to talk to you about today is something that I think a lot of people don't know that investigators actually do. Um, and uh, that would be 
what the role of an investigator is in a transaction and doing due diligence on on deals or also hires. Right. Well, due diligence is is I think is critical and it falls into a couple of areas. First of all, um, it's looking at the company to help identify potential weaknesses or vulnerabilities. Um, and let's say you're in the situation where you're looking to acquire a company. So you don't want to buy the company and then find out that there are issues. Um, we've seen this a lot of times, for instance, with intellectual property. You're buying a company and it turns out that they haven't protected their intellectual property. They haven't, uh, they don't have trade, their trademarks or copyrights, or, or if they have a patent, they haven't protected it, for instance. Um, so those can be vulnerabilities, just an example. You, you really want to know what you're buying. And, you know, it's very similar to when you buy a house and you have an inspector come in before, before you close the deal to tell you what are all the problems in the house. And they always find something. And there's always going to be something with a company. It doesn't necessarily mean something nefarious, but it may be something that you haven't anticipated. And at least if you find it in the due diligence process, then you can address it in your in your deal documents. Um, similar, and this also goes similarly if you're doing strategic alliances, joint ventures. It's it's really knowing who you're dealing with. And again, of course, you, in the first instance, you want to make sure you're not dealing with people that are criminals and the like. But for instance, you want to make sure if you're doing a joint venture with a company, what's their track record? Have they been successful in similar types of, of projects? If it's a licensing agreement, if you're licensing technology, um, how strong is their protection? of intellectual property? Have they had problems in the past? Um, you, you really want to understand that. When it comes to individuals, um, I always look at it in two, in two respects. First is the basic, what I call public record, civil criminal litigation. You want, uh, you, you want to understand if you're looking to hire a C-suite executive, um, you know, are they, uh, you know, do they have things in their past, in their litigation past that civil or criminal could be problematic? Uh, a big issue that's come up, particularly um, since the rise of the Me Too movement, is social media. And that's one thing we, we do a pretty big scrub of people's publicly available social media. You don't want to hire a senior executive and then find out that they have comments on social media, such as of a, of a sexist or, or, or racist uh, uh, nature. I mean, it is pretty amazing what people will post on their personal uh, social media sites, but you really want to know if there's an issue out there. That's kind of what I call uh, uh, one aspect. The other aspect is more, is more nuance, nuanced, which is, you're, you're looking to hire an, an executive uh, for, let's say, for your C-suite. Um, well, what do you know about their prior performance? You'll, uh, you'll, you'll certainly know from their resume or application where they've worked before, but how did they perform in that job? So, for instance, if they were CFO of uh, a number of companies prior to coming to your, applying to your company, how did they do? Did how did that company do? Did they have financial restatements? Did they run into financial problems? Was there something that occurred on that executive's watch that um, would suggest maybe they're not as good at the position as you as you may think they are? So that's a little bit more nuanced, but that I I believe is a very important part of of the due diligence that we do for our clients. Do you also leverage your contacts to find out things about people that may not be in the public record so easily? Is that, you know, do you have, you know, you have such a great network of lawyers and other professionals. Does that, is that useful in these areas? It can be. Uh, it, usually where it comes into play is if we find something in the initial search. 
like we find they're involved in some litigation at their prior company or their mm -hmm. prior company was involved in litigation where they were they were involved. Then we may talk to sources in kind of a second phase to say what really happened here? What was the role of of this person? Uh, this also comes up a lot on the international level. Um, you know, we have more and more individuals and entities from foreign countries coming into the U.S. doing business. And so you really need to know um, about their experience in their prior uh, uh, country. Um, a, from a standpoint, how did they perform, but also things, depending on where, which part of the world they're from, are their perspective issues. If, for instance, they're from Mexico, um, you know, are there any cartel connections? If Middle East, are there any connections to terrorist groups? Uh, if they're coming from China, a big concern now is the individual entity's relationship or current or former with the government. So there can be a lot of items that may need to be checked above and beyond available public record. Okay. Now, my last question to you on this, and I don't want to ask you specific sources or specific matters, but in light of all your contacts and all of your liaising with government agencies, do they ever contact you to help them? Uh, well, we've had situations where um, uh, we're working with a company and they come to us and say, there's something you should know. Um, uh, again, we're finding the federal government is being more user friendly. So for instance, when we're working with clients that are uh, particularly in, in fields like technology, biotechnology, they're constantly being targeted by foreign governments for um, espionage. Uh, stealing uh, data. So there are times where we have been contacted uh, uh, by an agency that says, we know you're working with this company. We want to give you a heads up that um, they could be a target of uh, a particular uh, government or government entity. I would venture to say that I don't think every private investigator has these kinds of relationships where you would get that call. I think that's an amazing value add for you. Thanks for tuning in to today's podcast. And if you want more info on the show, including information about other podcasts, please visit blockandtackleshow.com and you can find my contact information and social media. And you can also email me at carl at blockandtackleshow.com. Thanks for tuning in.